besides Sam Prine from Finch Prine mm -hmm. and uh, a few other local fellows that I didn't really know. Most of us didn't know each other, you know. Yeah. But when we got to Albany, we were slapped on a train and sent down to Atlantic City, New Jersey, yeah. for some basic training. And we stayed in an old hotel down there called the Kentucky Hotel. The floors were as uneven as can be because it was an old, old yeah. hotel. And uh, so that's for, and when we started training, they'd uh, march us out to what they call Brigantine Field. And there we, they had a guy, a guy with a bass drum whom we hated because he go like this and we walk and he started going and we were running and we were supposed to run. <laughs> and so we did a lot of basic uh, work out there. We didn't do much with dumbbells or anything until I got to aviation cadets. Mm -hmm. But uh, they at least put a, a bunch of running into us, you know, <laughs> put get together some shape. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about the others in your boot camp, your other, your uh, fellow mates, I guess? Well, we slept on army cots mm -hmm. in the old Kentucky Hotel, and it, it wasn't the greatest place in the world. Uh, I'll never forget at the mail call, uh, we had a sergeant, and he'd call us out and he'd say, I got a letter here for Mr. Prune, Mr. Prine, mm -hmm. and a letter for Mr. Holy. <laughs> <laughs> I got used to that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we we used to eat breakfast at the Hotel Tremor in Atlantic City, which was at that time one of the big hotels down there. And we used to have to wait in line, and it's just like the old Army expression, hurry up and wait. Because oh, yeah. we'd get over there and there'd be a big line waiting to get in to eat chow. <laughs> and uh, I only served KP once down there. And I had the job of knocking the food out of the trays as they came around. And when I finished, I was speckled with garbage from head to foot. <laughs> but anyway, it was, it was an experience. And from there, we were going to be pushed on into uh, the Air Force College Training Detachment Program. Mm -hmm. And so, why, I don't know, but they got us out one day and sent us all on a train to Goldsboro, North Carolina. <laughs> And we stayed there one night, and then we came back up to uh, uh, Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, oh, where yeah. we were to go to this college training detachment school. Mm -hmm. And I took physics and other college subjects there, and uh, stayed there for time. periods of time escaped me. <laughs> they, they don't mean much at this point. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, we, we served a, a time there and got credit for college, college credits oh, there. That's good. And from there, I went down to Nashville, Tennessee, to the classification center for fellows in my uh, category. And there they decided whether you'd be a, a qualified for pilot, navigator, or bombardier. Mm -hmm. And then all these tests they take you, they, they had a light in front of you and, and then a things for your feet, mm -hmm. and if the light came down and, and went left, you were supposed to push the left foot, you know. <laughs> and if, not, if the light came down and went right, you pushed the right foot. And I suppose it had a lot to do with how you would handle rudder control on an airplane. Yeah. Anyway, I qualified for pilot. So at that point, we, we didn't stay there very long once we were qualified, once, once they classified us. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Maxwell Field, Alabama, to pre-flight, which was an experience, because the train was met by all these guys with, with swords and sabers and dressed in Class A uniforms, and we were all berated to hell, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for being uh, newcomers. Yeah. And uh, that was to be our pre-flight training at Maxwell Field for a couple of months. Uh, because the aviation program uh, moves you every two months. Mm -hmm. uh, once you finish that section, I like pre-flight was two months um, basic training or um, pre-flight training was was at Clint, was at Maxwell Field, mm -hmm. and then we went to a uh, field way down in uh, Florida called uh, hmm. what was it? 
Arcadia, Florida, Carlstrom Field, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> the uh, college in Daytona Beach still has my name down as being a, an alumnus of their of the, <laughs> of the college of that cut school that ran it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the name of the school that ran the program, but anyway, uh, we spent two months there, and then we were transferred from there up to uh, Cortland, Alabama, which was our basic training center. Mm -hmm. We, you, you learned to fly a PT-17, a Stearman, which was a, was our first plane. Mm -hmm. Then we advanced up into the BT-13 and 15, B, the basic trainers, which were a little more horsepower. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. a little more difficult <laughs> and not so easy to fly. Yeah. And uh, I might just go back a little second. Mm -hmm. Back when I was flying in, uh, down in Florida, when I first started to learn to fly, I never had flown much back in those days. I hadn't yeah. flown. My buddies that joined the Air Force, whom I joined the Air Force with, uh, my personal buddies and in my neighborhood, uh, not, neither one of them made pilot training. One of them made the uh, navigator, and the other, I don't know what, what happened to him. But they washed out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the. Basic trainer was was not an easy plane, but oh, when I go back to primary, I hadn't I never flew much. So when I first started to fly with the basic trainer with my instructor, and he was a civilian instructor, mm -hmm. I had my hand on the sides of the cockpit like this. <laughs> and when on one of the first flights, he looked back at me and he said, he said, "Is your safety belt fastened?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well." I have a feeling you don't trust it," he said. So he flipped the plane over like that. So I'm looking down at the ground, you know, and then he jockeyed it back and forth a couple of times and let me hit the strap to the, the safety belt, and then he turned it back over. And he says, "Now, how do you believe that safety belt will hold you in?" <laughs> and I said, I, "I'm convinced." <laughs> That's funny. But there was subsequently to do. Uh, snap rolls and snow, slow rolls and stalls and things like that, mm -hmm. you damn well better have the safety belt <laughs> fastened. Yeah. Uh, where were you shipped out after boot camp? Uh, from uh, Cortland, Alabama, we went up to uh, Seymour, Indiana mm -hmm. to advanced flying school, and that's where I first got into a twin engine game, plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and we. Uh, as you can imagine, we practiced hard and long about flying straight and level and being uh, very easy on the controls, no monkeying around with sharp turns or anything like that. Yeah. And that's where I got my wings and my second lieutenant's commission. And uh, from there, they sent us to Columbus, Ohio, to Lockburn Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we met the 17 for the first time. The oh, 17 yeah. Flying Fortress. Yeah. And uh, we flew three fellows to a, an instructor pilot mm -hmm. in the 17. And uh, we took flights to different places and we practiced all the maneuvers for the 17, flying on three engines, flying on two engines, uh, start the stall characteristics of the plane. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, a lot of the radio procedure began to come into effect, mm -hmm. and uh, we stayed. We stayed about two months there, and then they sent me down to Florida to Avon Park, Florida. Mm -hmm. Avon Park was a place where I met my crew, oh, yeah. and it was a place where we practiced. Whereas Lockburn was transitional training, mm -hmm. Avon Park was operational training, mm -hmm. where you got the crew and you practice with the crew. And I know they scared the hell out of a lot of cows in Florida, because the gunners <laughs> used to like to get that thing going <laughs> and watch the cows run. <laughs> so I imagine the Air Force got a few bills for cows that got 
unexpectedly <laughs> laid up. <laughs> and anyway, we a uh, couple of months there, and they sent us up to uh, Georgia, uh, Savannah, and uh, I signed for two hundred and fifty thousand for a seventeen, and uh, we took off for overseas, and we f we flew to Grenier Field in Manchester, New Hampshire. We then flew up to Goose Bay, Labrador. We then flew to Bluey West One in Greenland, then to Reykjavik in Iceland, and down into Valley Wales. And the ironic thing about it was, everybody said, when you write home, don't don't mention these places. We don't want, that isn't general knowledge. And very shortly, in one of the uh, publications of either the Newsweek or the Time magazine, they had the whole damn thing laid right <laughs> out. You know, <laughs> it was supposed to be top secret. <laughs> Funny. So anyway, then we got over to Valley Wales. That was the reception center for the people flying over. Well, there were planes flying all the time. Mm -hmm. We flew singly. We didn't fly in any kind of formation. Yeah. And that's where I said to my navigator, if you're any damn good, you're going to hit Greenland from Goose Bay, because it's all ocean. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, after a required amount of time, he said, look up. And there's the coastline of Greenland, just like that, sharp and jagged. Yeah. And we had to fly up a fjord to get to the uh, airport, and you had to get in the first time, because there was a mountain up and back, and the mountains to the right, you couldn't go around. You have to get in. Yeah. And it's right on the edge of the fjord. And when you come out, you better get off the ground or you're going to be in the water. <laughs> and then you had to fly over the ice cap to go to Iceland. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, at, uh, in England, they allotted you to a bomb group. And we were assigned to the 94th Bomb Group, which is an air base over northeast of London. Mm -hmm. And uh, we. Uh, We got there, and I was told I had to fly with an experienced crew one mission in the right seat as a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then then I could fly with my own crew. And then we flew uh, ten wing missions, uh, which was really kind of hairy at first because uh, you his, the wing comes out like this from the lead plane. And you're flying off the wing, and you got it. You're supposed to have it tucked right in, yeah. even with that lead plane. And of course, everything is stable up there. We flew at 27,000 feet. Our missions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was a good experience. Uh, and we didn't we didn't hit really too tough missions. We got a lot of flak, saw some yeah. fighters, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we got up. We got ten wing missions in, and they said, "Well, you've got a good bombardier and a good navigator. We're going to make you lead crew." So they took us right off flying wing, and we uh, went through lead crew training, and we got to fly uh, six missions as uh, either the high squadron or the low squadron. Now there's three squadrons in a, on a mission. The lead squadron, they have a high squadron, and they have a low squadron. The low is the worst one to get because that's the one the fighters always go for yeah. first. You know? <laughs> but uh, the, uh, we did that, and, and we checked out as a lead crew squadron the day the war ended. So we never did get to fly one. Yeah. So we missed all the promotions and all that kind of stuff that went with it. Yeah. Ah, bad luck. Bad luck. <laughs> Uh, what was it like encountering the fighter planes? Pardon? What was it like encountering the fighter planes? Well, they had these ME-109s with cannon and 20 millimeter cannons in front. And you always hoped and prayed that when they came in on you, and especially getting to fly lead, lead crew, mm -hmm. they were always after the first one. Yeah. If they could get a cannon in that cockpit of that plane, that's yeah. gone because the pilots are gone. Mm -hmm. So it was hairy. Our, the gunners were very good about calling, playing bandit at 12 o'clock, bandit at 6 o'clock, 
and my guys at each other guns chattering away. We never picked up a lot of damage. We got a lot of holes, maybe, but uh, that, that was the extent of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we never got knocked down. I saw planes go down, but we never got knocked down, fortunately. And so, so that's where I got my 16 missions. Did you ever receive any medals or citations? The Air Medal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody got an Air Medal for six missions. I got three of them, I think, or something like that. <laughs> so, what was a typical day like in the Air Force? Well, it was it was could be very, it could be a easy day or it could be a tough day. We lived in Nissen huts mm -hmm. over there, and they had a Wood, a stove, wood stove in the middle of the hut. That was the heat. Mm -hmm. And the closer you got to the wood stove, the warmer you got. <laughs> but uh, well, other than that, we slept on bunks. Uh, and there was, we, we rode uh, weapons carriers. I don't know if you're familiar with a weapons carrier. It has seats along the side. Mm -hmm. And the six by the big trucks have the seats along the side. Yeah. That's what we usually went to the flight line in, mm -hmm. those big trucks. Yeah. Uh, but it was there was a lot of camaraderie to living together like that. Because yeah. uh, and it was unpredictable. You might go to bed at eleven o'clock and at twelve o'clock the guy comes around and wakes everybody up, you're ready for the mission. And you'd all had to have to have to head for the flight line. <laughs> Disrupt you completely. Yeah. Uh, it was never uh, cast in stone that you had a certain routine. Mm -hmm. The routine was very uh, variable mm -hmm. when, when we were living on the air base during, during the war. Yeah. Uh, but, but we went through. <laughs> we were going kind of back to a warm bed anyway. Uh, so what was flying like? You you still like to fly? I like commercial flying. <laughs> I always wish I had uh, gotten my private pilot's license after I came out, because uh, if I had, uh, there was a point in time where they were choosing fellows to fly generals around over there, mm -hmm. and I would have loved a job like that with a B-17s, which had been converted to uh, airliner type things for. Uh, flying passengers like generals and, and important people, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I like to fly, but the only problem was the uh, uh, ATC. We used to say, take down your service flag, mother, your son's in the ATC. He must be allergic to combat. Bring back my sonny to me. <laughs> so we, did, we didn't have good relations with the uh, air transport people. But because uh, they flew all our planes home, we didn't get to fly them home. Yeah. I came back on a victor ship. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the I liked flying, uh, but I had just I just had enough fill of it that I didn't want to uh, get into it anymore. And and it was difficult to compete with the ATC people who had accumulated so many more flying hours than we had. Mm -hmm. I only accumulated a little short of 1,100 hours, mm -hmm. and, and that, was, that was including aviation cadets, which was a 250 to 300. Yeah. But uh, uh, at any rate, the, uh, the flying, I had a chance to fly a C-47 over there. After the war ended, they got the C-47 in, and we were transporting supplies over to the uh, permanent bases in Germany. Uh, I, f I like, for instance, I had several trips down to uh, the Mediterranean uh, and fly uh, cots, tables, things like this. Uh, it was across the Mediterranean, uh, not Casablanca, but uh, huh, can't think of the name, but was, was it Iran? And we'd pick up the stuff, and then we'd fly back up to Marseille and RON overnight, go up the Rhone Valley, and hop across to Germany to first and Felbrook, the 
where, the, where they were setting up permanent Air Force bases yeah. in Germany. Yeah. And then I come back to England. So I had a chance to fly a, a C-47, which is, I thought was a beautiful little plane, <laughs> but wasn't as nice as my P-17. Yeah. So uh, were there many casualties in your unit? Uh, some. I don't remember as many casualties as like they had during the early years when they had raids on um, south, southern part of Germany there. Uh, the, the big 50 and 60 casualty raids where they lost that many bombers in one raid. There were some, some of those raids were fierce before the fighters came. Yeah. Our, our life wasn't too bad once the P-51s came over there because mm -hmm. the P-51s had wing tanks and could go further into Germany and so they could protect you against fighters. Yeah. And uh, the fighters didn't bother too much when the 51s were around, you know, because <laughs> yeah. the 51 was a good plane. And uh, so the worst thing that I encountered as far as danger was concerned was the flak. The flak was thicker yeah. than hell. We went into one place in Germany, and my bombardier is up on the nose saying, Dan, he said, Dan, look at the sky. He said, turn off, turn off. And it was black with black. Oh. And, and we were headed right into it because yeah. we were at that time called a chaff ship. We were pro pushing out uh, particles of aluminum foil and so forth to try to confuse the enemy radar oh, yeah. as to what our height was mm -hmm. so that they couldn't send their shells up into our altitude. Yeah. And um, so the, the flak, as long as you could see the black, it was all right. Mm -hmm. But if you saw a trace of red, god darn, things are getting close. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the shell burst. But so that flak was the worst we had. So where did your bombing runs take you? Where did you bomb mainly? Oh, we, we got over as far as Dresden, Bremen. Uh, Nuremberg. I got a whole list of them in my bed. <laughs> it was a, I think I don't think we really bombed the same place twice. Incidentally, the first mission I went on is on a, with another crew was to Berlin, and wow. uh, it was one of those big raids on Berlin. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't bad. I. I I don't feel that I put in a tough war. <laughs> the only thing I can say is that when people say, well, you, you went back to, to a bed every night and everything, I said, yeah, but every time I took off, I never knew whether I was going to get off or not. Yeah. And when we took off for missions, uh, we all used to go up to the runway. And one plane would go down the right side of the runway, and the next plane would go down the left side. Mm -hmm. And they'd alternate like that. Well, as you can appreciate, taking off so close together like that, geez, you could get up in the air if you hit the prop wash of the guy in the, in the plane in front of you. Man, yeah. you had no control. You just had to ride it out. Mm -hmm. And with a plane load of bombs, you wonder, Jesus, is that thing going to come out all right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was kind of arrogant. Oh, Airspeed. Uh, altimeter mm -hmm. to know where you were when you were flying. Yeah. You had no artificial horizon in those things. Yeah. Like we did, like you do like today, where you got a thing oh, yeah. to level it, you know. Yeah. And so these guys got into a turn mm -hmm. and they never realized what they were doing and they all crashed into the ground. All eight of them. Uh -huh. I lost three of my roommates from Maxwell Field in that night. So it wasn't particularly confined to combat that we lost yeah. people in, 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 in aviation cadets. Yeah. Uh, so I, I feel that the, it, was a, it was a risk. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I guess you, where were you on December 7th, 1941? I was in college. Right. Do you remember that day well? Pardon? Do you do you remember that day well? Not particularly. Mm. Uh, what was going through your mind during combat? 
Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, you underestimate is how much uh, attention and focus that you have to pay attention to the flying. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started, in, way back in, in uh, Maxwell Field when we were going through pre-flight training, they took us to a high altitude center down in Montgomery, Alabama. And what you did was you sat on a bench and you, uh, they took you up to uh, altitude, 25,000 feet. Uh, and uh, at 12,000 feet you put mask on, an oxygen mask. And then they had always had one guy, they didn't put a mask on and just let him and they had him sign his name at 12, 15,000 feet and you couldn't even read his handwriting. And they say, this is the subject of, this is what anoxia or lack of oxygen does to you. Yeah. And so, uh, when we were flying at 12,000 feet, we were on oxygen mm -hmm. because uh, you didn't want a, anybody to suffer from anoxia. Yeah. And so that was, uh, uh, but that was something I always remembered. I said, geez, I'm going to be so worried about that and clearing my ears and things yeah. like that that I won't be able to function. But you forget the concentration and the focusing you have to do to fly. You don't even think about it. Yeah. You never even thought about your ears. <laughs> no. Uh, where were you when the war ended? Uh, where were you when the war ended? I was in uh, on the ba air base in England, mm -hmm. and I didn't have enough points to get home. <laughs> so they sent me over to Germany, and that's where we, uh, us bomber guys, we got over there, and we were assigned to a air transport group. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should have seen some of the first basketball games we had. <laughs> Elbows flying, everything. Oh <laughs> we didn't. There was not good blood between us. But mm -hmm. we went over there and we were assigned to this air transport group. But they gave, kind of gave up on that after a while. And they assigned us to various places around the Germany. Mm -hmm. I got assigned up to Tempelhof in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in a dorm up there that was much like a college dormitory. Yeah. And, uh, they wanted to know how I was going to get my, I wanted to know how I was going to get my flight time in every month because you got flight time for every four hours mm -hmm. each month, four, four hours flight time. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, we have these little, these little army liaison ships. Mm -hmm. The guy says, come on, come on out and I'll take you out in one. So he, we got in and he climbed in. He, uh, took off once, went around, came back down, says, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, so that's the way I got my four hours in for the month, was mm -hmm. to fly that thing around Tempelhof. And if you recall the Berlin airlift, they had mm -hmm. a high apartment buildings around Tempelhof that made it very difficult for some of those C-54s to get in yeah. when they were loaded. Well, me and my little old army PT, <laughs> Geez, I come floating over those things down in. <laughs> I got my four. I got my four hours in that way. But it was kind of fun doing it. How close did you ever come to the enemy during combat? How, how what? How close did you ever come to the enemy? Well, in the air, uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. They're there all the time. The fighters were there. Mm -hmm. uh, I just. Felt very lucky that one of those ME-202 cannons didn't get in the cockpit, that's all. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about Truman's decision to use atomic force against Japan? I guess I, knowing what he knew, I'd have to agree with it. Mm -hmm. I, that's one thing that I wondered. We went to Dresden once. Yeah. I was on a raid to Dresden where they killed 50,000 people. Yeah. And, uh, I've, I've often thought, you know, how many people was I responsible for my bomb load for dropping on mm -hmm. un, unsuspecting people, innocent people? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you, when I got to Berlin, 
up at the Tempelhof and got to walk around a little in the in the city of Berlin. It was desolate. Mm -hmm. They had those airplane raids and knocked the hell out of it. There might be a corner of a, a of a building sticking up, and those poor people were so desperate for places to stay, you'd find them living in a corner of that bombed out building. But uh, the damage that the bombs bombers had done was fantastic. They had really obliterated it almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the bombing of Dresden like? Can you explain a little further? Well, it was good and it was bad. There's a, one of the problems, if you hit a, an initial point, is where you turned onto your bomb run. Mm -hmm. If the weather was good, no problem. Mm -hmm. You could trap. But if the weather wasn't good, if it was cloudy, then you think, my God, am I, are we hitting the right place? Because normally, when I was lead crew, uh, my bombardier was the guy that all the other planes dropped on. Yeah. They didn't have individual bombardiers in any of the wing planes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, when you got on a bomb run and, the, and it was cloudy, I know at one point I had a major, my command pilot, on one raid, and we looked up and there was a group of open bomb bays going over the top of us. <laughs> Uh, Gee, get up in here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it it could be very hairy on the bomb runs when it's like that. Mm -hmm. But we did we did bomb by use of the of a of a toggle ear uh, when you were a wing. The wing crews had toggle ears, what they called them, mm -hmm. who would bomb, drop the bombs when the lead crew dropped. Mm -hmm. Do you have any fond or happy memories of wartime? No, I have a lot of memories of wartime. Uh, I don't know that they was anything I want to repeat. Yeah. But uh, I guess I wouldn't take anything for the experience I got in it. The, uh, Did you continue in the service after the war? No, no. Well, I, I say no. Uh, after the war was over and I was discharged, they automatically gave us seven years in the reserves, mm -hmm. which would be toward retirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I decided I was going to get out. I didn't want any more, more party getting called up again. Yeah. But then they came out with the announcement that if you stayed in the reserve, they'd pay you for, for meetings and so forth. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't blessed with money at that point in time, so I said, sure. <laughs> so I stayed in. Yeah. And so I stayed right through till I got 20 years and seven months. Wow. So I am uh, I retired, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired USAF. Wow. Now, but the, I'm thankful I did that because now they have what they call TRICARE for Life. Mm -hmm. It's a health program which the Congress promised the service people mm -hmm. that they'd take care of them for life. Yeah. Well, if, if you didn't get your 20 years and you aren't uh, eligible for this TRICARE for Life, mm -hmm. but, but I am because I got the 20 years in. Yeah. And Martha, she has a card just like my ID card. Uh, that, uh, that she can go on to any she can go on to any base in the country, mm -hmm. Air Force, Army, Navy, whatever. Oh, that's cool. I'm sorry, I don't have my leather jacket here. I have a nice leather jacket that I cost me an arm and a leg in, in Great Britain after uh, the war started. And uh, I had an airplane on the back, I called it my plane, the Red Garter, mm -hmm. and I had 16 bombs on it for my missions. Mm -hmm. But uh, my son has it out in Colorado. <laughs> he was going to make a uh, some kind of a setup with all my stuff I had, because I've given him just about everything. Mm -hmm. My boots I had, I came back, I gave to my nephew down in Hudson Falls and 
and uh, I've given away all my uniforms. Uh, I don't have any connection now. I, I wanted to make it easy on my wife to <laughs> get rid of all my stuff. So how long were you gone in total time? Well, I left in uh, uh, January of 1943. Mm -hmm. I was discharged on, uh, in May of 1946. Uh, do you keep in contact with any of the people that you met? During I, the still, I still exchange Christmas cards <clears throat> with my radio operator who lives in Jacksonville, Florida, and my bombardier. He lives down in uh, Val Rico, Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a very good buddy that I roomed with up in Templehof who lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana, whom I still exchange cards with, John Hamm. <laughs> and uh, I lost track of my tail gunner who lived in California. He was 10 years older than us and we always called him Pop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for, for some reason or other, I've just lost track of him. Yeah. And I never had have had contact with my co-pilot, my navigator, and I, oh, I just had, I, my, I asked my daughter to look up some of my crew, and my, my ball turret gunner mm -hmm. was a little guy, yeah. as you can appreciate, yeah. they had to be to get in the ball turret, yeah. and his name was Hillel Wisner, and he, I got a letter back from him, he was down in Florida, and uh, I wrote back to him again, and he never replied. So I got I got a feeling he didn't want to, he didn't want to write back and forth. You know? huh. So that's that's the extent of my yeah. contact with my pre my crew. What was your first job after the war? Went back to college. Mm -hmm. What did you study? Economics. Mm -hmm. Did do you think that your military experience? Helped you? Yes, sure. Gave me free tuition. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> that was an important feature. Yeah. Did you uh, receive any education from the GI Bill? Is that what that was? Yes. Yeah. It was from the GI Bill mm -hmm. that, that they passed that I got that money mm -hmm. to go to school. Yeah. Did you ever go back and revisit the places that you served? No, no, I, I've never had really any desire to. We used to have a, uh, on a booklet that was put out by people that were in the 94th Bomb Group, mm -hmm. uh, the 94th Newsletter was called, and uh, they, they republished a lot of the stories in it that <laughs> fellas had, you know, and mm -hmm. so forth. Apparently he's trying to get time in the Make money. <laughs> yeah. I only have a couple questions left for you. Okay. Uh, can you just tell me a little more about your family? Well, uh, I married a girl I met at college. Mm -hmm. She worked in the library over there. And uh, we didn't have any children for many years, so we decided to adopt some. So we adopted a boy and adopted a girl. Oh, very nice. And, uh, my daughter lives in Boston, and my son lives in Colorado, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the extent of our family. And uh, my uh, my daughter never married, mm -hmm. but my son has his grandson, and Martha has two kids, a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. and the girl never married, <laughs> but the boy had two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So it's the boys that have given us the offspring, yeah. <laughs> not the girls. But uh, So Martha's my second wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I was married 29 years to the first gal, and, and Martha and I will celebrate our 30th in December. Wow, good for you. December 30th. Congratulations. <laughs> And did you ever hear of any of your friends from Hudson Falls, if they made it or if they died during the war? Uh, yeah, there was a fellow, I noticed in the program last night, there was a Lansing Elliott in there. His brother Lee Elliott was in my class and he died on Okinawa. Mm -hmm. He was in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
We had a few casualties in our class. I don't recall. Lee Elliott was one of the one I do recall. Mm -hmm. um, my a fellow I grew up with, Randolph Holmes, lived oh, over yeah. on the next block from me, and he died at the oh, Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Yeah. He, he, he's, his body's still on the boat that he died on. Yeah, my teacher was telling yeah. me about that. My uh, One of my good friends, Art Langlois, just passed away this last January. Mm -hmm. he, he was 85, same as me. Mm -hmm. He was a helicopter pilot, and he had two, two hours in Vietnam. Wow. And uh, so he had quite a service. Mm -hmm. uh, Harold Bates and one of my other friends, he flew B on B-24s out of North Africa, and uh, he got knocked down at Ploesti oil fields. And they had, uh, he said he had the crew all lined up against the wall, and these Hungarian people were all set to shoot him. And this German officer came along and says, no, no, we don't shoot officers. <laughs> <laughs> so he said they were saved. Yeah. But he he weighed about 215, 220. He, he was in prison camp, and when he came out, he weighed 139. Oh. And uh, he, he passed away, and I, I always figured that uh, a lot of his problems came from that damn prison camp internment. Wow. Well, that's all the questions I have for you, Mr. Holly. Well, I, like I said to my wife, I said, I, I don't have the bill of an honor. I didn't get a DFC or things <laughs> like that. I'm just an ordinary Joe, really, you know. Oh, it was great for and, me, though. And I, I trained to do something, and I did it. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to come back. Yeah, one of the lucky ones. And that's the way I look upon it. Well, thank you very much.